it's great to be here in person. Uh, I met you, you know, Dave Lindicum actually worked with Sapnik for a while. That was before he uploaded his consciousness to the cloud. <laughs> he doesn't actually appear in, in uniform anymore. <laughs> <laughs> he's on, but he's still you know, physical, but he's really in the cloud. All right, well, let's see, here we are. Very good, okay. So uh, my name is Jason Bloomberg. I'm uh, president of Zapnik. Um, we are an industry advisory and um, a training firm. Uh, now part of Novell Technologies, uh, Novell is a, a government contractor based in the D.C. area, so uh, we were acquired earlier this year. But we're still Zapnik. So today I'll be talking about architecting with the cloud, how enterprise architects should think about cloud computing. So first of all, uh, Dave did a good job of like not defining cloud computing. So let's get started. So what is cloud computing? Well, it's really a whole bunch of old stuff that's all been thrown together into something that is now new and new. Cloud, right? So what sort of old stuff is now? It's old wine, new bottles. Well, let's start in the, the little lower left hand corner. Software as a service, right? Salesforce.com, that phrase, even though now it's part of cloud computing, it actually predates cloud computing, right? It was around for a number of years before anybody was talking about cloud computing. Uh, utility computing, that's a pay-as-you-go financial model. So the idea with utility computing is that you could rent it like uh, your electricity and uh, make shift capital cost operations. Uh, then starting in the lower right, we have on demand. Now, I'm on demand, that phrase was an IBM catchphrase for like three or four years until IBM customers convinced them that nobody had a clue what IBM meant by on demand. But essentially, what they meant by on demand was this notion of dynamic provision. Right? Capabilities, if you need more, you can get more. If you need less, you can get less. So it's available on demand. Uh, virtualization, of course, has been around for a while, not in the context of the cloud, but in the context of your own data center, virtualizing physical resources, like storage. <laughs> processors, etc. Uh, application service providers, they uh, hit the scene back in the late 90s, part of the dot-com phase. Uh, ASP essentially was a, a third-party data center, right, where you could uh, rent an empty rack and put your servers, or you could rent empty servers and put your software, or you could rent uh, software and put your data, right, whatever deal you could make with the third-party providers. It's a way that you could avoid having your own physical data center. And then the World Wide Web itself. Right? And a great thing about cloud computing is that all of the startups, IT startups, now are in the cloud. Why? Because VCs don't want to use their money for physical uh, infrastructure anymore. So they're all in the cloud. So if you run into a, uh, an entrepreneur, a startup, uh, you know, some sort of event, some sort of startup, and uh, you ask him, well, what are you doing? It's like, we're in the cloud. And you ask him what that means. Well, then you can access our software via standard interfaces over the internet. It's like, yeah, we call that the web. Been doing that for almost 20 years. Now it's the cloud. Ooh, we're a cloud company. Okay, so you roll all this stuff together, and there it is. It's the cloud. Now, as uh, Dave mentioned, NIST, the National Institute for Standards and Technology, actually a government agency of the U.S. Department of Commerce, uh, has come up with what is essentially the, the best and best regarded single definition of cloud computing. Nice and concise. There it is, right? A model for enabling convenient on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources, right? A variety of kinds of resources, network, service, storage, et cetera. So very many different kinds of things can be in the shared pool. And then they can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. Well, this is essentially the best formal definition of cloud computing we have. And this is one of the problems with cloud computing. Because this is not your general business audience definition, right? And too many big words, right? Uh, I, I once saw a segment on cloud computing on CNN. They can't use this. They can't even use that first phrase up to the parentheses. That's it's still too technical. Well, they say uh, cloud computing is you know software that runs over the internet. That's how CNN defined it, right? This is the problem. One of the problems with cloud computing is. If you boil down the definition to something you, that a general business audience can understand, it is dra dramatically incorrect, right? So the most concise definition is still too technical for a general audience. It makes it very hard to talk about cloud computing in a, in a general audience or with a you know, business audience. Okay, so we'll talk about, uh, there's a couple of NIST slides. Cloud service models, this is something that uh, Mike will be talking about, right? So, nice slide, you know, software as a service, platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, and Dave listed just about anything as a service you can think of. But I won't spend too much time on that. And then the uh, essential characteristics of cloud. So we have the three deployment models, private, community, and public, that Dave talked about. 
the number of essential characteristics, and there's quite a list, right? So uh, quite a lot of things that cloud computing essentially is a, a characteristic of cloud computing. And the most uh, challenging, important one is rapid elasticity. Right? Rapid elasticity is essentially at the heart of that on-demand notion, right? That if you need more of whatever resource you are extracting in the cloud, you can get more. If you need less, you get less. So you can deal with spikes in demand in a seamless, automated way. And if it works right, if you have rapid, seamless, automated elasticity, we have the illusion of infinite resources. This is one of the reasons why the cloud is so cool. Now, we all know there's no such thing as infinite resources, right? But there's the illusion, right? If there's always a little more than you need, no matter how much you need, there's the illusion that it's infinite. And that's part of why the cloud is, is, is really has that cloud aspect to it. It's infinitely large. Okay, so. This is basics, let's move on to the cloud. There we are, okay. Okay, well, it's not crap, in the, it's not crap, but it's spaghetti. But more or less the same thing in the IT context. This is your application, okay? Some mainframe thing, some ancient legacy spaghetti code. Let's move it into the cloud. There we are. <laughs> That's it. Take your spaghetti, go stick in the cloud. Well, actually, Dave stole a little my thunder here because this is the crap in the cloud problem, right? That you can take the, there's, the, there's this uh, misconception that you can dig any old thing. And all you have to do is stick it in the cloud, and it'll just fly by. It'll take, it'll take advantage of all the, the networking, take, uh, all the great power of the cloud. Well, it, it's still crap in the cloud, right? Okay. Well, we're not quite spaghetti code. We're some sort of job application or whatever, object oriented. Could follow all the OO best practices. It's like it's not really that old. Not really that old. Okay. So we have our object oriented application. Let's put it in the cloud. There we are. <laughs> is that all there is to it? Well, again, no, even though this may be well architected in an on-premise context, moving it to the cloud uh, introduces new architectural challenges. And that's something I'll, I'll be talking about. Okay, so from the enterprise architect perspective, and Dave uh, also uh, uh, stole a little of my pleasure here. Well, step one, begin with your business objectives. Techies love forgetting this step. Techies love taking the, uh, this is cool, let's sell it to the business approach. Right? Well, whatever it is, this is cool. Uh, Java is cool, it sells to the business. SOA is cool, it sells to the business. Cloud computing is cool, let's sell it to the business. Well, that's always pushing a string, right? You have to start with the business problem. A problem bad enough, the business is willing to spend money to fix it. Otherwise, you're just spinning your wheels, right? So start with the business objectives, right? Develop technology initiatives that support the business objectives. Right, as Dave mentioned, EA is about aligning IT to the business. Determine the current enterprise architecture, what's your starting point? But leverage existing assets. And leverage existing assets is very important as well. Right? You can be, if you're a startup and you want to do something in the cloud, you don't have any existing assets. Right? You can do everything in the cloud. And that's great. That's a lot of fun. There's a lot of great entrepreneurs out there doing that. But if you're an enterprise, right, you have a lot of existing stuff, um, and you want to leverage that. Right? You spend a lot of money on it, but it still provides value. And now cloud computing has to work in the context of all the assets you already own. Okay, so your business strategy drives your IT strategy. Nothing cloud specific about this, but the idea is from the perspective of the enterprise architect, the cloud gives you some additional options that are now added to the list of options that you had before. So all the stuff you could do on premise, you have all, this, all these capabilities, all these challenges, all these issues, all this business value. Cloud computing now adds to the opportunities, adds to the challenges, adds to the value, but it's within that greater context that adds to your options, new tools in your tool belt. So, enterprise architects love talking about current state and future state. Current state, completely screwed up. Future state, all your problems are solved. <laughs> Well, the, future, the current state usually isn't really screwed up. That's okay, but future state, there is no future in the bottom state. Right? When were you ever done with all your projects? Finally cross everything off the list, say, okay, we're done, IT works perfectly well, we can go. Well, that's unrealistic, right? Because business needs continue to evolve, technology continues to evolve. There is no future state in the bottom <coughs> that is like fixed. What we're really doing is moving from the as-is state to increasingly greater agility. Right? We want to be able to respond to this change of business needs better and better. And that's essentially what we're trying to accomplish with our transition strategy. So how are we going about that? Well, we want to 
establish a sustainable enterprise architecture. We want to include cloud computing in that. And there's three basic areas where cloud computing helps a long-term enterprise architecture strategy. Application modernization, right, getting rid of old stuff and moving to new stuff. Managed services, leveraging the cloud as a set of capabilities that gives you additional capabilities. And application rationalization, we have a whole bunch of redundancy, a whole bunch of duplicate capabilities, and we want to leverage the cloud to help us with that. Okay, so there's three core de cloud deployment choices for the enterprise context. And actually, Dave touched upon this with a slide that was thrown out very differently, so it's sort of interesting. Two different perspectives on the same, same uh, notion. So the first is, uh, let's say you have this legacy app. Well, the cloud gives you some options in terms of extending it. So you can put new capabilities in the cloud, keep existing capabilities on-premise, for because there's a priority to do that, and then you integrate them somehow. So this is part of the integration of the service that, that Dave mentioned. That might be one of your options. Another option, let's say we have this legacy app and we're trying to get rid of it, we're trying to retire it. Well, we can move its capabilities to the cloud, possibly, either one of them, you know, sort of one, one possible option. So here we're leveraging the cloud to help modernize some legacy application. And the third would be, say, a fully service-oriented perspective, Right, we can think of the cloud as being an option for hosting uh, loosely coupled business services. And we have on-premise options for hosting loosely coupled business services. And the goal of SOA is for those services to abstract the underlying technology to support flexible business processes. So we can compose those services in different ways to support flexible processes. And from the perspective of the service composition, it doesn't matter where the software is running. It could be on-premise or in the cloud. So we can build these compositions where now it's no longer relevant which, uh, where the software is physically located. Okay, so you're an architect, enterprise architect, helping your organization uh, move to cloud computing, leverage the value of cloud computing. So, of course, architects love roadmaps. You're going to help with a cloud computing roadmap. I'll take you through some of the basics. As Dave said, culture is a good starting point. Culture support assessment. What that means today won't mean this in a few years, but today what that means is you should ask whether or not you're an early adopter, right? Because we're still in the early adopter of cloud computing phase, or what I like to call the teenage sex phase, right? Everybody's talking about it, only a few are doing it, and nobody's doing it well. <laughs> we're still there. So the problem there is you may be an early adopter. If you're an early adopter, you're looking to leverage the cloud to get a competitive advantage, even though there's a lot of immaturities, the products aren't mature, the standards aren't mature, et cetera. But chances are, it's more likely than not you're not an early adopter, in which case it's better to take a, 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 a toe-in-the-water uh, approach. This is what a lot of organizations are doing. They're leveraging Salesforce.com or another software as a service offering, or they're moving an email to the cloud or using cloud-based storage, you know, some of the early steps. Okay, once you figure that out, define your goals. An interesting thing here, is that the goals are quite, there's quite a variety of different kinds of goals you may have. Right? Cloud computing isn't good for just one thing, it's good for a lot of different things. So you may have financial goals. Uh, in particular, you might want to shift capital expense to operational expense. Uh, you might have operational goals. So you may want to uh, uh, deal better with spikes in demand. Where before you had to have this whole server farm that was mostly idle most of the time, you want to now deal better with spikes where you don't have to have that, all that idle hardware. You might have competitive goals, right? You may want to leverage the cloud to roll out new products and services better than your competition. I have a strange feeling in Mars thing. And uh, service levels, right? You may have specific service levels. You want better performance, better reliability, or some other specific requirements that you want to move to the cloud for. You want to quantify these benefits, right? If you're moving operational cap or op to operational expense, What's it worth to you? What, how valuable is it to your organization? You might have specific performance targets in terms of reliability or elasticity, and top line benefits, or how much money you're going to make with your new cloud offer. To determine the role of cloud in business and IT, this is where you get to do a little spin, right? Because it's your job to explain what you're doing to a broader audience, to the business audience, as well as to the broader IT audience. So what does it mean for your organization to be doing cloud? Are you focusing on certain applications, certain capabilities, certain business problems? What is the story you're going to tell? Of course, you want to mitigate risks, governance and security. 
Uh, we can, I could talk to you about that for hours, but that's not the topic today, so if you have to do it, let's move on. <laughs> you have to choose uh, cloud models, public, private, or hybrid, as Dave talked about, and then you put together your actual tactical plan for milestones. Okay, so what about architecting an application for the cloud? Right, you can't just pick up that spaghetti, stick it in the cloud, right? So what do you need to do? Well, you need to re-architect your application to take uh, advantage of specific cloud benefits, in particular elasticity, but also the fault tolerance of the cloud. And if you don't do this properly, then you won't get the benefits of elasticity and fault tolerance. In fact, you'll have, probably have uh, more downtime rather than less if you don't architect it properly. The bottom line here is if you do your work, you'll probably end up with a better architected application uh, all, all around. Because right. so a lot of times, existing applications have all sorts of issues that you're able to get around because you can throw more hardware on them, or you have a team of people. If something goes down, they bring it back up real quick. You know, the little, you know, the little mice uh, spinning wheels uh, making the application work. You move to the cloud, you can't afford this. Right? You have to allow for the fact things are going to fail, the network's going to slow down. Uh, you have to deal with spikes in demand in an appropriate way. So if you don't have the proper architecture, you're not going to get those advantages. Okay, so challenge of elasticity. So, what do we really want in terms of elasticity? Well, we want to be able to scale up in a rapid, automated way that's measured, right? So we're paying for what we use, so it has to be measured. Uh, and it's reversible, right? If our spike in demand goes away, we can scale back down again in an automated way. And this is an enormously powerful part of the cloud. Uh, cloud of value proposition, and one of the differences between the cloud and traditional on-premise computing, right? So this is a key value proposition that you may be thinking about. So the challenge is, you don't know how many cloud instances your app is running on from one, one day to the next. Yeah? Do you suggest the application should be aware of this? Well, you, are, you have to architect appropriately, but actually, that, that, is, that is a good question, and I have a specific answer to it coming up. Okay. Well, you're going to have issues, and then I'm going to talk about that. But actually, that's a good point, right? If you just picked up your spaghetti code and stuck it in the cloud, you'd have that issue. Mm -hmm. Your application would have to know what instance am I running on, how many instances are there, or how does this instance interact with another instance, right? And that could be a real challenge. Okay, so one of the challenges has to do with data consistency. Uh, and this is actually uh, a theorem called the CAP theorem that says that no distributed computing system can guarantee immediate consistency, availability, and partition tolerance at the same time. It's a mathematically proven theorem. So what, is, what are we talking about here? Well, availability, right? We definitely want the cloud to give us available capabilities. Uh, partition tolerance means essentially that we can put it on multiple instances, and if one instance goes down, the overall app still pays. So we want it to be partition tolerant. If it's not partition tolerant, we're not going to get the elasticity benefit. So if we need availability and partition tolerance, the only thing that can suffer is immediate consistency. All we can guarantee in the cloud is what we call eventual consistency. So your data may not be consistent all the time, but that's just the way the cloud works. So if we require seamless data consistency, essentially you require a partition and tolerance environment, say an uh, enterprise database with two phase commits. That's partition intolerant. It runs in one partition, and it's vertically scalable. For the cloud, cloud bill is partition tolerant, which gives it horizontal scalability. Okay, so partition tolerance, right? This is the key here, right? It's partition tolerant if it continues working even in the case of a partial network failure. And those you can plan on and expect in the cloud, right? That's part of the way the cloud works, is you'll have partial network failures. You have no idea what's popping up. But the cloud is designed to recover from those quickly and automatically, but they still happen and you should plan on. So, uh, as a result, cloud, cloud environments are inherently partition tolerant. So, you know, I have some pretty wacky images. Would anybody recognize this movie? Cool movie. Brazil. Brazil, very good. So it's partition tolerant, right? This table's being pulled through the partition. I'm just playing a joke. <laughs> so, actually, we can no longer have acid transactionality in our databases because that is a partition intolerant approach. If you require that, you don't want it in the cloud. It, the way the cloud works is it follows, instead of acid, it follows base. Now, I didn't make this up. It just, 
Who knows? In fact, this whole notion of Bayes predates the cloud. It's been around for a number of years. So what is Bayes? Well, it's basic availability. Supports partial failures without leading to a total system failure. We definitely want that in the cloud. Soft state and eventual consistency. So eventual consistency, well, let's talk about soft state first. Soft state means that if, you're, if your state isn't refreshed, it expires. It's like, wow, how can we do that? And eventual consistency, it's okay to use stale data some of the time. So this is a different way of thinking about how good your data have to be for you to survive in this world. But if you think about it, this is the way a lot of the web actually works. This is why when you do a Google, Google search, it gives you an approximate number of results. Do you ever notice that? Maybe 125,000, approximate. Well, why don't they know the number? Why is it approximate? Well, well are you just not paying them enough money to give the real number? No, they don't know the real number because it's only, they only have eventual consistency. If, they, if you do the same search on three different computers, you might get different numbers, right? Even if going against the same set of data. Soft state is familiar from instant messaging buddy lists, right? If your buddy is connected, you see a, a little icon that says he's available, right? And let's say his computer crashes, or he you know, drops off the internet, he, he switches his phone to airplane mode or something. Well, the message doesn't get sent, so your audience client doesn't know he's no longer available, right? So he's, he's, he's available, but he's not, right? He's off the internet. Well, eventually, a time passes. As it were said. So that's a very common behavior that we're used to, but that is also part of the way the cloud behaves. Okay. So here's the question Are you ready for inconsistent data? Right? If you're building, say, an inventory system, right? Well, you, what's the role of an inventory system? To tell you how many widgets are in inventory. And if you can't get that right, what's the point of having an inventory system, right? So it depends on how you think about your application. Right, it's a different way of thinking about what it means to offer uh, data from a cloud environment. Right, you have to rethink your application. And if your application is designed to assume the sort of data consistency you get from a traditional data environment, then that's something you have to rethink in terms of how your application is uh, architected. Another key challenge, and this is, this is the trickiest one of all, and actually gets to your question, uh, the challenge of state. Where, how, where do you maintain state information? So you, you're in your shopping cart, and your shopping cart's in a particular state, right? You put something in it, it stays there, you're here, and this step of the transaction, that step of the transaction, right? where is that state? Where do you keep it? Well, we keep it on the cloud instance. And that's the problem with the crap in the cloud, spaghetti in the cloud. Because traditionally, we put state in the application, right? Well, the problem there is it's not fault tolerant, right? If the instance goes down, you lose your state information. And it doesn't scale very well. We put it on the persistence tier. So every time you put, every time any customer puts anything in a shopping cart, you write that information to the database. Every single time you write to the database. Well, that puts in scalability challenges. Right? Everything you do on the client is now written to the database, every little step. So when you keep it on the client, well, that's actually the best approach. But it requires an architectural approach that enables hypermedia to be the engine of application state. So the hypermedia, that is the set of resources interconnected by hyperlinks, becomes the engine for application state. Does anybody recognize that, friends? Hypermedia is the engine of application state. I have one guy smile. The rest of you are cool. <laughs> hypermedia as the engine of application state, also known as Hadeopis. Well, what does this mean? Essentially, the client, the client, so this is the browser or the client application, if it's not a browser, dedicated app. It would be a little box churning out the coupons on the supermarket uh, register, right? Whatever. The client interacts entirely through hypermedia. So basically a person is clicking links, is what we're saying. Representation, so that's like web pages or any other file that the server sends to the client, whether it's a web page or an XML file or image or whatever it is, uh, reflects the current state of the app through hyperlinks. And following the links, essentially is how you maintain state for the application. So the hyperlinks themselves contain opaque references to persistent state on the server. So we have state on the server, and we have state on the client. So HadeOS, what the hell is HadeOS? Right? One guy is smiling, the rest of you are saying, what the hell is HadeOS? <laughs> well, it's one of REST's four architectural constraints. Anybody here heard of REST? Okay, got about a third, that's, that's bad. 
Oh, well, I'll define it for you. So the rest is essentially an architectural style. And the, uh, when we say architectural style, we mean a set of architectural constraints. And REST has four specific architectural constraints. And Hadeoist is one of them. Uh, but this is the one that Restafarians struggle most with. Because it requires thinking about hypermedia applications, as opposed to thinking about uh, interfaces to pieces of software, which is where Restafarians, the followers of REST, like to work. But it's the most important one. Because what is REST for? REST is architectural style for building distributed hypermedia applications. Right, like the World Wide Web, or anything else interconnected by hyperlink. Okay, so what is REST? On stands for representational state transfer, and it's a style of software architecture for distributed hypermedia systems like the web, or any other sort of application that is interconnected by a hyperlink. So this fellow here, Wayne Fielding, he invented this thing in his doctoral dissertation. He works for Day Software now. Now, he's, he's a pretty sharp guy. He uh, actually was one of the original creators of HTTP before he wrote his doctoral dissertation. And he came up with REST not sort of from thinking about a blank page. Here, you should all follow this. No, he looked at the web and said, wow, look at the web. It's horizontally scalable. It's resilient, where right? parts go down, they come back up. And there's no single person in charge of the thing. And it just keeps running. Right? That's pretty amazing. Right? Wouldn't it be great if all our enterprise apps or a huge set of our enterprise apps were, had those great properties of the web? So what are the core architectural principles of the web that we can distill and abstract so we can use them for other kinds of applications? And that's how we came up with REPS. He looked at the web and saw that it was good. He <laughs> wanted to make sure we knew how to do it. Okay. So we'll talk about resources, which are essentially the things the server does for you, entity or capability on a network. So it could be as simple as a web page, or a JSP script, or PHP or Python script, or something more sophisticated. It could be any kind of file. A representation is a concrete manifestation of a resource, so it's what the resource gives to you. So a PHP script might generate an HTML file, and that would be the representation, or an image, or a vector graphic, or a media file, or other sorts. And hypermedia is a style of building systems by a network of multimedia nodes connected by hyperlinks. So hypermedia is a generalization of the term hypertext, only it's not just text anymore, it's any kind of media. Right? You can embed links in media in your videos or uh, image files or any number of different kinds of media. Okay, so the four architectural constraints for REST, separation of resource from representation, uh, manipulation of re uh, uh, resources by representation, self descriptive messages, and the big one, hypermedia as the engine of application state. So I don't have time to talk about the first three, but the fourth one is a critically important part of our story today. So KDOS and Ash, hyperlinks dynamically describe the contract between the client and the server in the form of a workflow at one time. So there's this word contract. And if you're familiar with service-oriented architecture, Contracts are an essential part of what it means to define a service. So we have a contract for a service that is, <laughs> specifies the relationship between the consumer and the provider of the service. Well, now we have contracts between clients and servers in the form of a workflow at runtime. So this is a way to implement processes in the context of interconnected hyperlinks, aka multi, uh, hypermedia, uh, that leverages the power of service-oriented architecture because we're talking about the contract between the client and the server. Okay, so REST, so coming back to the notion of state, REST provides explicit state transitions because the communication is stateless. So if you're familiar with how HTTP works, it's primarily stateless. I mean, you can set cookies, but let's not set cookies because you can turn those off. So if we turn off cookies, essentially we have a stateless protocol. Well, our communication is essentially stateless. And this is Hopefully, you'll be getting the idea how this reconnects to the cloud computing store. If each client request to the server must contain all the information needed to understand the request without referring to any stored context on the server. And this is the key point, right? Because if we store the client context on the server, and that server is a cloud instance, then we have a problem. Because that cloud instance, we want it to be elastic. So instead of just having one of them, we might have five or 10 or 20, and then we next day we might have 10 or 20 or 30, right? That cloud instances 
essentially have to be stateless because there's no way we can store the client context on them. So the server stores the state of its resources, and resources contain data and links representing valid state transitions. So we actually have two different kinds of state, right? Resource state, which does get written to the persistence tier, and application state, which is maintained in the hyperlinks. Okay, so what the hell does this have to do with cloud? I should have went off and left field, didn't I? Well, actually, it's all part of my plan. Here's the app before the cloud. Okay, so what do we, what do we have? Well, okay, a simple representation of an in-tier application, like persistence tier, application tier, client tier. Okay, so what are we doing? Traditional app, this is pre-cloud. <coughs> well, we can scale that thing, right? And there's different scaling approaches, right? Uh, on the database, we have sharding, data virtualization, a variety of data-centric approaches, so we can you know, scale you know, Oracle databases. We have a lot of options for scalability there, right? Uh, on the application tier, we have clustering and other techniques like that. And we can also do load balancing on the network. So requests come in from clients, and we have a huge uh, number of clients. We can distribute requests to a server farm, right? And so we can, we can scale this any way we like. How are we dealing with state? Well, we can deal with state on any of the tiers. Right? We can persist state. If you want to keep it around, you just write the state to a database somewhere. We can maintain state in the application tier, session beans, threads, session cookies, there's a whole list of variety of different things that can do that for you. And then we can put, we can actually maintain state in a traditional app on the client, say with HTTP cookies, putting information in the URL, or hidden fields, there's a few different techniques for that. WS addressing is a web services standard to help you with that. Okay, so let's put this in the cloud. Here's your app in the cloud. So, your database is in the cloud. There's not just one database. It could be one today, tomorrow it's five, the next day it's 10, right? Because it's elastic. Might be more, might be less, and it's going to spawn additional instances as needed in an automated way. Same with the application tier. You're not necessarily doing both of these, and one or the other or both depending upon the needs of your application. It all depends. But you might be doing both. So your application tier has to be stateless, because of the reasons I explained, right? You could have more or fewer of those, and you don't know from one day to the next, from one minute to the next, how many you're going to have. And then your application state, as I talked about, has to be maintained on the client. Okay, here's our one. This is the coolest slide. Took me hours to get this one. You did It's the bottom question. How about that? Okay. Didn't let me drink before. Okay. It was stateless. <laughs> okay, so I'm, I'm on the Amazon website, right? I'm on the client. I need my shopping cart. What am I going to do? Okay, so I go to a database to fetch my shopping cart, right? The back end spawns a cloud instance, which is now going to handle my e commerce transaction for me. So the back end provides a hypermedia representation of your cart to your application instance. So that could be, I've had a little process diagram there, that could be, theoretically could be a Beeple file, although Beeple is a bit sort of recent end of life, YAOL is getting more familiar with YAWL, yet another workflow language, but it could be any kind of representation of the shopping cart application as a set of hyperlinks. So essentially it gives that to the instance. And now the, the client, the, the user, can interact with the shopping cart instance running on that particular application instance in the cloud. Okay, and so the user clicks links and completes forms, and that's how you work your way through the shopping cart. Now it doesn't help you go back to the database unless it has to update the resource state or to fetch something from the resource state. But if you're just moving through the application, you're just clicking around something that was given to you from when it first loaded that. The advantage here is, Let's say I need to spawn another one for scalability purposes. Or I actually have multiple of those in, at, at the same time. Let's say this user now clicks a link and it's served from a different instance. Well, the instances are stateless, so they're all doing the same thing. So as long as it has the same hypermedia representation of the cart, it's going to work the same way as any other instance. Because the instances themselves are maintaining state. So here's the powerful thing, right? Okay, so we're done. We've, Every, this is the happy path. Right? Nothing broke, 
So we could spawn another instance of Hadoop for scalability, where we can complete the transaction, and something has to be written to the systems tier, namely the completed transaction. Right? So we're not, that's a happy state. But what if something goes wrong? Watch this. Crash. Okay. <laughs> so what happens if a cloud instance crashes in the middle of your shopping cart, your e-commerce process? Well, the old way, you have a problem, right? Because either you've been writing states to the hard drive every single time so that you can somehow reconstitute it, which will be very hard to scale, or you're putting state in the middle tier, which is more traditional code, in which case, sorry, an error occurred, please start over. We've seen that before. And if you hit, the end of your credit card number and hit submit and then get a crash, that's when the customer is really pissed because they don't know if the charge that went through or not. We've all been there, right? Okay. What, about, what, what does the cloud do in this situation? We spawn a replacement cloud instance automatically and rapidly with the same representation. So the same logic that now corresponds to this particular customer um, but it's, it's there, basically there, has all their resource state. So what products are already in their cart when they first came to the site, for example. And now we continue the process, because the application state is maintained on the client. So the hybrid, so if the client is seeing a web page, and the application crashes, and reconstitutes itself, respawns itself, the reason the client can continue where they left off is because the application state is maintained in the links. So they click a link for, you know, the next step is enter your address. The page they see is the page they're expecting because that's here, right? Any information about where they are in the application is maintained on the client. So they can continue on their way. So essentially, that's the, that's the key. Right? We need to make sure the middle tier is stateless because that's the only way we can achieve elasticity of the middle tier, which means we need to use a hypermedia approach, KDOs, in order to achieve this. That means typically re-architecting your application. It's not like your application was necessarily designed this way to begin with, right? Now, here's an experiment. Uh, go to the Amazon website from two different computers or two different browsers on the same computer. You know, launch Firefox and Chrome or something, whatever. Now, go to your home page, put something in your shopping cart on one computer, and you'll notice when you refresh the other one, the number goes up. Okay, because uh, Amazon maintains your shopping cart state as resource state. So you can come back 10 years later, and there it is in your shopping cart. The price went up, but it's still there, right? Okay, now begin the e commerce process. On one of those computers, start going through the process of purchasing something. Well, if you're, if you're familiar with Amazon, which I'm sure everybody is, at one point you can change the number of each item, right? So you're, you're midway through the e-commerce process, and let's say you change the number of items you want from one to two of whatever it is you're buying. Now refresh the other browser. It stays at one. So you have one shopping cart at Amazon, one computer says two items are in it, the other one says one item is in it. Try it at home. That's the way it works. Why is that? Because Amazon cannot guarantee immediate consistency because they're partition tolerant. They're essentially following more or less this approach. Now, if you look at their URLs, you notice they're not 100% REST. So for your REST environments out there, they're not 100% REST. But they are following this approach to maintain a, a client state uh, on the client, maintain application state on the client, so that they can be running a fully partition tolerant environment. Okay, so there's more to this story, right? Because I'm not necessarily talking about your application. I've talked about the elasticity of the middle tier, the elasticity of the database tier. Not every app requires both, right? Your situation is going to be unique to your particular environment, your particular business context. So you have to answer, you as the architect, so you or your architect has to answer these questions. Where do you require scalability? Where do you require elasticity? And which of these options are right for you? And actually, that's going to be something you're going to talk about. Which of these options are right for you? So if you don't know, the cloud is the op answer, unless you request. <coughs> All right, that's my talk. Here we go.
ideas yet on how much this will actually save in the long run? And just well, well, that's an important question because one thing Dave mentioned is it doesn't necessarily save you money. That's part of what you have to think about. One of the things that we've seen is that cloud computing will, will save you money if you do it right, but not a huge amount of money. Right? So we talk, saw one, one case study, it was about 20%, which is pretty good, but don't expect like 300%. And that's only if you can achieve some of the architectural benefits, you know, elasticity, fault tolerance benefits. Well, I was thinking more along the infrastructure side, right? So not everything, not a savings isn't always necessarily the, the end customer that's doing it, right? It might be the person who's laying the groundwork mm -hmm. for the sites and things like that. So, I mean, in terms of data center sprawl and stuff like that, I mean, is there, has anyone done an estimate? Well, that's something every organization has to do for themselves. I mean, one of the benefits of the cloud is the low initial cost. Right? This is why all the startups love it, right? Because it keeps your initial cost, if you're just rolling out a new application, or let's say you have a new website that you expect to have tons and tons of traffic, but you don't yet, right? The, the cloud is a great way to keep the initial cost low because you know the costs are only going to go up if you need that capability. So, so but it's still worth doing the projection. Because you want to make sure that over the full life cycle of the application, that it's going to be more cost effective. Otherwise, you know, you, 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 may, you may not be delivering the value to your intended. So that's a key point. Um, but uh, it, you know, it's, it really depends upon each organization. Yeah, question three. I think one reason that varies too is because if you look at your infrastructure platform, you have. Your storage platform may be an enterprise class system, but the application or the environment you're putting up doesn't need that level of availability. It doesn't need the storage tiers that you have, so you're probably overspending there. Whereas if you deploy in the cloud in the right place, it may not matter if you're on a on a low end SAN or even just direct attack storage. So there may be some savings there, so I think it varies across the board depending on what your requirements are. Yep. And sometimes the, the value of shifting capital operational costs <laughs> is, uh, you know, you have to measure how valuable it is to you. It really depends upon your organization. Some organizations, uh, if, if you're in a highly regulated industry, you know, the regulation dictates, you know, this much money for capital, this much money for operational expense, in which case being able to shift capital operational expense frees up your capital budget for other things. That might be a very high priority to your business. Other organizations, you know, private companies, may have to be more, you know, just the executive would say, oh, I just move money from here to there, and, and, and you know, it's less important to you. Uh, but it can still be a, a value. It's just like, you know, do you buy do you buy something or lease it? The same decision, right? You're shifting capital operational expense. Essentially, the cloud is another way of leasing these assets, and, and maybe a, a cost benefit, depending upon your, your high end situation. Yeah. This is kind of a really broad question, but um, could you talk a little bit about, like, the application development ramifications of the sort of the, the Haiti OS or whatever, this hypermedia representation of data, or is that a completely different paradigm than say what traditional object-oriented developers are used to? Or we, I'm having a little trouble kind of wrapping my mind around that. And yeah, there's a lot more to be said on that. I just didn't you know, have the time in this talk to, to go through it. Um, most, most developers who start with REST start at the other end of REST. They say, well, you know, we can uh, think about addressing resources on the network by an um, HTTP request that follow a, a uniform interface. We have four key operations. We're going to stick to those. We're going to format our URLs, or generally speaking, our URIs in a particular format. And this gives us a, a way of loosely coupling, coupling the um, uh, request, you know, representation from the resource. So that's one of the four. Principles, um, and then you work your way up to Haiti OS, and a lot of developers struggle with that. But if you think about it, Haiti OS is essentially the way the web works. Right? If you think of any a hypermedia application, is just another way of saying website. Only we're abstracting every we're abstracting the web and we're abstracting the site. <laughs> so we're taking the idea of a website and abstracting it, so we can use any kind of media representations, and we can have any kind of server capability provide those media representations. So it gives us all the power of building this website. But if you, when you're working in a web environment, then you're comfortable with the stateless nature of web interactions. Um, and this essentially moves that to the next level, saying, well, there, there's a formal way of dealing with application state, where if we follow certain rules about constructing these hyperlinks, we're able to build more sophisticated applications. But one of the interesting things is how it ties to cloud computing. And I know not too many people have really thought through that, 
that's why that's why I spent time on the animated slide. It's like putting, making sure your cloud instances are stateless is going to be an essential part of achieving the benefits of the cloud. And hey, we have this approach that we've been using for the web for years that that makes that easy. Right. So it's relatively straightforward. I mean, it's HTTP centric approach that follows the, the model of the web, and we've been doing that for 15 years. The reason they're stateless, I think, is important to know from our crowd is that it's the application that helps in prior like spoke applications and you have to know everything to ask. Whereas for us, the idea is you find out more information as you request. So you ask and then it turns you back in inventory, then you can yeah. ask a more intelligent question. And that's the paradigm shift of Enosis is that you, it's a more intelligent dialogue with the server abstracting more information back to you as opposed to kind of a, a classic SOAP transaction where you kind of have to go dive in and not know the answer. Right, uh, it's the power of the self-descriptive messages, which is a part, which is a third of the four uh, REST constraints. Right, each message, that's each interaction between client and server, and not only has the data you're looking for, but all the relevant metadata. So uh, the, the limited notion of this uh, appears in web service interactions, right? Where you know, a SOAP request has all this metadata for all the data, and that's part of why SOAP requests are so, you know, SOAP interactions are so verbose, that there's so much metadata in them. But one of the challenges with the web service approach is that contracts are externalized, so they're developed at design time, so they're not dynamic, right? To, to update a contract in the SOA context requires uh, elaborate governance and versioning, and it's a, it's a big challenge. So how do we version services without breaking consumers and maintaining loose coupling? And you know, our, in our license mapping marketing course, we spend hours on that because it's such a big challenge, right? So that's one of the challenges with, with REST. Uh, Hypermedia, you know, the, the work, the, the, the contract with the client service representative is the workflow at runtime. So it's dynamic, and we can build it as we go, as you said, uh, by providing metadata-rich um, uh, descriptions with every interaction. So the other key advantage is with web services, you specify the operations. And that's always been a problem with web services. You, each vendor handles operations differently, and uh, it's awkward, it's difficult, and it locks you into an RBC, a remote procedure call approach. Even with Optimus style web services, still have that RBC context because you have to specify the operations. With REST, it's taken away from you, right? You have get, post, put, delete, and that's for every interaction, you pick one of those. Well, now you don't have to worry about it. All I have to worry about in the server is making sure you know what to do if somebody says a get, a post, put, a delete. As you say, if the server says, well, I'm not sure, then it will respond with, here's some options, right? And now the client can pick one. And there's a variety of different ways of establishing client-server negotiation. So, um, so on one hand, from the developer perspective, it's easier. On the other hand, it requires a different way of thinking. Which makes this live so much fun. <laughs> Other questions? In, in referring to eventual consistency, um, especially in a high volume, high availability, uh, distributed application and data, are, is the implication that really a, a big data or NoSQL solution is optimal? How would you in, compare and contrast that to a, a traditional relational database in that environment? Well, you have to, and there's so many things in the data world, you have to balance competing concerns. Right. So how important is horizontal scalability versus vertical scalability? Right. So is the way you're going to scale vertical scalability, you're going to you know, buy you know, bigger, bigger servers and build this uh, you know, load balancing clustering infrastructure to run this huge database. Right. That's like vertically scaled. Horizontal scalability is like the web, more like the cloud. Right? We have multiple instances, and we're just going to you know, move stuff around. Right. So that's, that's one of the questions. And the other question it has to do with what you're trying to accomplish with your data. Right. Sometimes asset transactionality is critical. Right. If you're dealing, if you're a bank and you're dealing with uh, account balances, right. uh, we, we can only I mean, go log into your bank account site and they'll give you an approximate amount of money you have. <laughs> it's not going to go over to the investment, right? So sometimes that's not good enough. But uh, like with an inventory system, well, if you really need to know whether you have a single item left in inventory or not, that might not be good enough. But if if it's good enough to say, well, we typically have hundreds or thousands of items, but if we get below 50, we're going to tell the user, we'll let you know in, uh, we'll send you an email to let you know if you got your product or not. Right? Only if the threshold crosses some minimum number, and then uh, you know, an hour later they get an email, oh, you got the product, oh, you, 
didn't, we didn't charge you credit card, it's back order, cancel the back order, here's the link. That might be good enough, right? So you have to think about what the requirements are and you know, uh, for all the trade-offs, which way do you want to go, right? So it's not a question of saying which is best, it's a question of understanding trade-offs and understanding your problem set so that you can make the right decision. You can actually pick other variations of uh, yeah. arms and partition power. So, uh, you know, when we talk about events, cloud is not just eventual. It's just, I think that was a point that was kind of driven. That's not, it's not at all. Like, there's all sorts of databases that you use in the cloud. There are ones like S3 for Amazon that are absolutely eventually consistent. No question, no option. If you store to it, you may not get your data back immediately. Um, there are other forms of databases. In, in Amazon and open source like Cassandra and open OpenSQL databases at all different levels, even to the point where there are some of them you can actually run them as ASC transactions or run them completely as ASC transactions. Yeah, you may not have noticed that's actually part of, part of the slide. Uh, I got this slide from a Couch Database uh, guide. The Couch Database is at the overlap between autonomous and availability, so they're an eventually consistent approach. But Paxos, for example, enforces consistency because that's what you want, but it's willing to allow the availability to suffer, right? So this, this is, uh, the theorem is you can't have all three, but it's up to you which two you want, right? And there's the you know, different, and, and different vendors are, you know, placing bets in different sections of this diagram. There's a lot of different options. Okay, um, just one last comment. Jason Ellis has a wealth of information. Uh, I, I've used him in the past. They have a solo boot camp. It's like five days. So obviously, four, four, days. Four, four days. He can speak for five days. But, <laughs> but, but, but I mean, it's a really good technical vendor agnostic discussion about solo. And it's kind of how where I did a solo a long time ago, kind of got learning on it. It's a really good class. So if anyone's interested in solo training,